Welcome to We the People, a Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, president of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us. Culture wars continue to be hotter than ever, with universities and colleges often at the center of the storm. Much of the controversy revolves around an effort to prevent students from being exposed to or discussing ideas that might be offensive or triggering. Yet proponents of free speech argue that higher education is exactly the place where students should be exposed to ideas that they find a little uncomfortable. Unfortunately, the cancel culture that's infiltrated higher education has also found its way into workplaces, K through 12 classrooms, and much more, raising serious questions about the future of free speech. Our guest today has been a warrior in the cancel culture trenches, and has sound advice for anyone trying to navigate our current environment. Greg Lukianoff is the president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, better known as FIRE. He's also an attorney and the author of several books, including the New York Times bestseller, Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure, uh, a book which he co-authored with Jonathan Haidt. Greg, welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Greg, for a long time, the lack of viewpoint diversity and suppression of free speech seemed to be largely concentrated in higher education. But in recent years, we've seen it infiltrate just about every institution, from business to government to the arts, even elementary schools. Do you think what was taking place in higher ed was simply a foreshadowing of what was to come or... Put another way, did the culture of higher education influence or cause today's free speech issues to infiltrate other sectors? Um, Definitely. The culture of uh, of higher education is influencing all sectors of of the United States at the moment. Uh, We're probably a little bit too... um, We give people who went to uh, elite colleges um, too many... uh, uh, too too much leeway. Basically, we, we overvalue it, and that means that our, uh, our discourse is dominated by people who graduated from Yale or Harvard or Stanford. And these are places that frankly just aren't very good on free speech. They have very low viewpoint diversity um, and, it's, uh, and it's hitting corporations like crazy. It's, it pretty, it's practically everywhere. But I, will, but I do wanna be clear about this since it actually refers to a book that I wrote for Encounter, a short book called Freedom From Speech, which I w- wrote way back in 2014 when, when things started getting really crazy on campus, even worse than it had been in, in, in my previous years, is that I do think that as societies become more comfortable um, and as they're able to organize around shared values, all of which sounds lovely, um, people get less comfortable with the difficult process of freedom of speech. So I do think to some degree, um, what's going on on camp, uh, what's going on nationally with, with, with the lack of comfort with freedom of speech is a problem of progress, um, but higher education has absolutely accelerated it, absolutely made it worse. And the idea that you can't see some of the, frankly, bad ideas coming out of higher education everywhere now, um, it, it's something, it's the trend really accelerated in the past few years. I think it's been particularly concerning to see the culture wars play out in elementary schools of all places, where mm-hmm. in many places, young kids are being taught to think or act a certain way. Do we need a fire for K-12? Well, you know, I, did, I think in a very real sense, fire is the fire for K-12. Um, we're, we're doing a lot more in, in, um, uh, in K-12. through uh, We have Bonnie Snyder um, on, on staff. Uh, she actually came out with a book called Undoctrinate, which I highly recommend talking about indoctrination uh, in K-12. through um, I also wrote, uh, partially because so much of the debate about K-12 through has been around what they shouldn't teach, I wanted to have something positive and say, this is what they should teach, and this is what their values should be. And it's all rooted in individual liberty, um, for that matter, things that make people uh, d- d- make people stronger in, in their views and understanding based on the whole kind of idea of anti-fragility, which we talk about um, in Coddling the American Mind. So I have my 10, my 10 recommendations for uh, reform-minded parents uh, that I've published in a number of places, but I'm going to try to do a real push for this positive vision of what higher edu- uh, what, what K-12 education education should be. Uh, you recently made some real interesting comments, provocative comments in the on the Megyn Kelly podcast. It's not unlike you to make some provocative comments every <laughs> now and then, uh, including an assertion that college students should be refunded their tuition 
if they're not offended at least once before graduating. Talk about that a little bit more. Sure. I've been saying this my whole career, but I, I've forgotten to say it in recent years because I thought I'd done it to death. Uh, but being offended is what happens when you have your deepest beliefs challenged. And if you make it through four years of higher education without having your deepest belief challenge and being offended by it, um, you should demand your money back. And unfortunately, we see the exact opposite happening in higher education, a sense that you have a right not to be offended, which used to be a punchline when I started in this field 21 years ago, um, seems to be something that universities are, are, are prioritizing over the search for truth. Uh, let's try to look at the positive side of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been some recent efforts to combat cancel culture and protect free speech within higher ed. You know, take, for instance, the Academic Freedom Alliance, yeah. which is an alliance of prominent college and university faculty members who are actively defending free speech within the academy, or the University of Austin, which is an entirely new university that was created, created out of the frustration with the current higher ed culture. Now, that's a really tough thing to do, but mm -hmm. they're trying. Yeah. Uh, do you think these are signs that the pendulum is finally swinging towards free speech and academic freedom, or are these just blips along the way? I wish I could say that the pendulum is really swinging back sufficiently. Um, is the pendulum swinging back to some degree? Probably, but nowhere near sufficiently enough. As for the Academic Freedom Alliance, I, you know, when I first heard about it, when Robbie George told me about it, I'm like, that should be that should be part of fire. Um, and Keith Whittington, who's on our board, yes. is, is the main spokesperson there, and I'm very pleased. I, I've learned a lot from what they've done right. Um, I've been very impressed by them. It's nice to have another entry into the field, really to pick up the slack for the American Association of University Professors, which I think a couple, like last summer, two summers ago, actually came out against the academic freedom of some professors uh, because their student complaints, so I think it's mind blowing. <laughs> um, and when it comes to uh, University of, of Austin, um, one thing that has blown me away is how hostile the reception was to that on social media. I and I went on the New York Times podcast um, with uh, Jane Coaston, you know, basically to make the argument every American should be pulling for a University of Austin to succeed, even if you don't agree on the culture war stuff, which of course you should. Um, that, that that speech is is silenced on campus. Uh, higher ed is too expensive. It's too bureaucratized. Um, it doesn't have enough rigor. Um, it's, it, you know, there's great inflation. We need uh, new experiments. But partially, I think, because some people really did view it as a threat, there was an attempt to just say, no, you know, who cares? Um, I think we should all be pulling for University of Austin. I'm happy. I, I want to see it succeed because we badly need some new blood in the field. Totally agree. Your organization, FIRE, was founded nearly 25 years ago to transform the culture within universities so that they would do what they're really supposed to do, which is promote scholarship, honest inquiry, debate. As you look back on those 25 years, uh, what have been some of the ways in which you think your organization has really succeeded? Well, one thing that we've definitely been able to achieve is that when we first started um, following speech codes on campus, and this was the insight of Alan Charles Kors, one of our, our co-founders, yes. Um, that uh, uh, that campuses, even though it was very clear that speech codes were illegal, um, unconstitutional at, pu at public universities and a bad idea at private universities, um, that amazingly, uh, about 75, uh, a little bit more per percent of the campuses that, that we uh, evaluated had insanely unconstitutional speech codes. Um, through a combination of lawsuits, both uh, you know brought by fire, but also by groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom, um, we've been able to reduce, uh, but also our speech code of the month program, which I've always been very fond of. We point out ridiculous speech codes and have every single month since 2006. And so far, we are nowhere near running out of examples, but we have gotten the number of red light speech codes. That means the most ludicrously suppressive speech codes down to below 20%. So we have, people shouldn't, there's reason to be concerned and even to a degree to be somewhat pessimistic, but not so much you give up on higher ed. American higher ed is too influential on so many factors, of, of, of so many as, aspects of American life that you just can't give up on it. Let's look to the future. Uh, what What's next for FIRE? How does FIRE intend to continue to ensure that academic freedom and free speech are protected? Well, you know, definitely as, as we get bigger, well, we're, we're going to be doing a lot more public education. Um, the problem is, and, and, I, and I understand that people can be very harsh on students who are anti-free speech, but I have some sympathy for this reason. 
Nobody's explained it to them. From K through 12, from orientation on up, they're not learning about the value of free speech. They're actually learning that freedom of speech is a big part of the problem. And this is partially because K through 12 and higher ed can't admit that they are the power brokers now. Uh, and whenever you're actually in charge, free speech looks like uh, looks like a threat. So we're trying to take it directly to parents, directly to, to, to people. We're doing everything from advertising to comic books to books about psychology um, to documentaries. One thing that I really love about FIRE is we're very creative in how we reach people. And we know that the real battle is to make sure that free speech continues to exist in the United States and is protected um, in perpetuity. Greg Lukianoff, thanks so much for being a warrior, sometimes a lonely warrior in these <laughs> trenches. And yeah. Thanks for the great work that FIRE has done for these many years. Thank and you, course, and thank you for your support. Thanks very much, Greg. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode of We the People. 